Is Lacazette on his way to Atletico Madrid? And will Tammy Abraham replace him? And what happens to Balogun? All up next on She Knows Arsenal. Let's go. Hey guys, welcome to She Knows Arsenal. My name is Jessica and I'm your host and you can follow me on Twitter at It's Jessinho. Give me one second, you guys. I do have some people that I said could moderate. So let me just go ahead and get that done now. Give me one second. DJ, you're now a moderator and so are you, Jordan. Perfect. All right. So, yeah. Last time, you guys, I know that there were a lot of you that were um, not feeling the the Chelsea fans being the moderators. And although I do like those Chelsea fans, I think they're nice people. It is Arsenal-based channel. So, um, yeah, I want to make sure that everybody feels comfortable. So the new moderators are now all Arsenal fans. So should should go well. Should go well. There's 45 of you guys watching already. Make sure you like the video and subscribe to the channel. And let's get on with it. So Lacazette, he, okay, so basically Atletico Madrid are supposedly reading a bid for for him and Arsenal are open to offers. We, we already know that. Um, it's been heavily reported that Lacazette is somebody that we're looking to move on. Um, although I do believe that Arteta really likes Lacazette, I think this is a good time and probably the only time to move him on considering um, his contract length. Um and the congestion that we have at the front of the pitch in our striker positions and an opening bid from Atletico could be around 13 million and our snore looking to, I think, get around 15, um, 15 to 17, I think. So that would be a little bit off, but that being said with the contract length, again, where Lacazette is in his career, we don't really have a lot of leverage when it comes to, you know, uh, negotiating for, for this fee. So part of me feels like this might become one of the, the deals where we'll have to just kind of take what we can get. And if Atletico is willing to give us 13 um, million and take them off of our hands, we'll be releasing, you know, quite a bit of wages as well. Um, I think it's a good move. Hold on real quick. You guys, Harry's here. Hey, Harry. Hey, what's up? Uh, how are you? Happy Monday. Happy Monday. Yeah, good. Thank you. Hope you're doing well. Hope everyone watching is doing good. <laughs> I'm doing good. So we're talking about Lacazette and the fact that he's, um, I guess, Atletico could be coming in with a bid for him for about 13 million. Arsenal are looking for something closer to uh, 15 to 17, you know, but um, for you, you know, just in terms of, Lacazette and what he gives to the team was one of our top scorers last season was um, somebody that the young players really talk about a lot as a leader in the side and, and all of that um, is 13 million to you just too low for Lacazette or do you think it's kind of just take the money and run? 
I wouldn't say it's take the money and run, but I think with a short contract left around 13 million seems about right for me. Um, just because of his age um, and obviously his overall ability. So to be honest with you, I wouldn't be too sad if we sold him for around 13 million. I think it's more of a case of how we'll use that money to strengthen in that area and if we'll use that money to strengthen in that area and on who would, would make me maybe question the move. Um, if it's for someone like Tammy Abraham, I'd probably be keen to keep Lacazette. But if it's for something maybe a little bit more proven or a little bit more exciting, um, I would say take the money to, to contribute and fund that deal. But I mean, anything for me around like 15 million would feel like a better deal. But, you know, 13, 15, pretty close, isn't it? Yeah. And I think when we did our, you know, a, like transfer show originally, I think I said about 15 million for Lacazette. That's about as much as I think we're going to get for him. So, I mean, if they could just up their bid a little bit, I think you take it and you move on. Contract link is not great. And I do think that even though he had a good, it's kind of similar to Jaka in this way, even though that they had good seasons last season it's still kind of time to maybe move on and just change the face of the team a little bit and I wouldn't be surprised if he was kind of ready to move on you know Arsenal really hasn't been I don't I'm not gonna I'm not gonna speak for him and say that um he, he hasn't had a good time because I don't know but I would just think that you know coming in and being the main striker and then six months later having somebody like Aubameyang come in and then he just seems to always kind of be the the second guy, you know, the other guy, you know, and usually when you're the other guy, you get a, a lot of negativity. So do you think Lacazette maybe just maybe on his, like if you, if you were Lacazette and you got treated the way Lacazette has been treated from the Arsenal fans, you know, would you be kind of maybe ready to go as well? Yeah, I think we've all been that other guy, haven't we, in life? And sometimes you want to maybe uh, feel appreciated a little bit more. I think for him, it's probably about maybe getting one big final move, uh, you know, a good pay increase. And if we're offering him, you know, a very similar deal to what he's currently on, just to protect the investment, I'm sure he would be aware of that. And maybe he wants to be appreciated a little bit more. I think um, similar to someone like, Socrates and, and Granite Xhaka and Bellerin and even Mustafi to a certain extent. I think Arteta really values their uh, their personality, their approach, um, and probably values Lacazette's efforts, like you mentioned about his role within the younger players. Even though that doesn't translate to goals, it's really important that you have people like that in the dressing room. Um, yeah, so I feel like Lacazette overall, I think he could, could be fairly positive about his time at Arsenal. But yeah, I do get the sense that he probably wants to be wants to be the main guy. And when you're playing up front, I suppose, you need confidence, you need goals. You're only going to get that with trust. And it, I get the sense that Arteta doesn't trust him fully. Um, so, yeah. I think, you know, for me, it's... I always felt like one of Aubameyang or Lacazette needed to leave. You know, not that I don't think that they feel their... I think, you know, from a profile perspective it would kind of make sense to have somebody that kind of plays off of the shoulder and then somebody who comes a little bit deeper and does the build-up play. But in terms of whose team is this, it's it's kind of unclear when you have both of them there and one suits the system better, but one is your main guy, you know? So it just kind of seems a little bit like it, regardless if it were a bombing or Lacazette, just removing one of them and just kind of clearing the pathway just a little bit might alleviate some of the confusion. You know, but when you look at the way that we play and the fact that Lacazette seems to fit so neatly into the way that we play now with um, Arteta's like newish system, even if you brought in somebody like an Abraham who's, you know, do you think that he has enough of that build up play per se to make up for Lacazette? You know, because he's for for somebody, I think Lacazette like was really, really good at that role. You know, and I would be kind of like, ah, oh, if we didn't have that anymore, Abraham doesn't really strike me as somebody who's amazing at buildup. So do you think that that might be something that we're maybe overlooking in a tabby Abraham is the fact that his buildup play is not as good as Lacazette's if he yeah, were to come think, in? Yeah, I think so. When I said that, I'm not sure Arteta trusts Lacazette. I think it's from a goal perspective. But what Arteta does trust in Lacazette is that buildup play his ability to be a nuisance. And for, for what is, you know, he's quite a small striker. He's incredibly strong on the ball, holds defenders really well and rolls defenders really well. And when you're talking about players like Saka and Pepe, 
who are playing on the right hand side, they're always looking for someone to play it into. And Lacazette can be that guy, or Lacazette has been that guy. And I don't see that in Abraham. So maybe it's a question of just after to play into Lacazette's strengths, and Lacazette's strength is, is sometimes back to goal. And maybe if we bring in Abraham, everything will become a little bit more crossing based or more about getting in behind, similar to how it maybe should be with a with a peak Abamyang. So I'm not sure if the striker dictates Arteta's approach because it doesn't feel like Abraham is going to give you what Lacazette gives you uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But maybe it's an area of, that Abraham has shown that he can do it a little bit and, and Arteta's seen that anything to right, I can get him, you know, playing with his back to go a lot more. Uh, so we have to wait and see on that one. But yeah, that's why it doesn't feel like for like and that's why it feels weird because when we've been playing well, or playing some good football. We even saw on, on the weekend, Lacazette is is involved in those little intricate moves in and around the box, more so than Aubameyang. So uh, I suppose maybe Abraham will just give us something different, but I don't know if that different is right. Like, what know, is the different? Different. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. I think that's what I'm having a hard time, like... Is it the I Giroud see... element? Is it the Giroud vibe that we want with Abraham? For someone to just bring on or, or put crosses in. And I know, because I know Aerily, he's not amazing, but at least, you know, I'm sure you can work on that if you've got the height and you've got the, the, leap, the leap, maybe you can get that instinct. Is it is that what we're looking for? I, you know, honestly, I don't know. I think from a statistic perspective, he looks very decent, you know, and then profile with the age and all of that makes sense. But from a, is he going to fit in the system? What, problem is he's solving which for me the main issue is we need a more well-rounded striker somebody that has kind of the the build-up aspects of Lacazette but can have the physical ability in the box it's hard to find that in a striker that's going to cost you anything less than like or you know what I mean like those type of strikers that can do the build-up play but is also give you that physical aspect in the box are very hard to come by is even Dominic Calvert-Lewin doesn't have that. He would give you the physicality in the box, but his build-up play is quite poor. So when you look at Abraham, he can do a little bit of a lot, but he's not really elite mm -hmm. at anything. And I think that's where I'm trying to grasp, like, what problem does he actually solve? He's probably the best you can get at $40 million, but would it be best for Arsenal to wait and, you know, use what we have? and bring in an elite level striker, obviously it's going to cost you more, but it's really good at a lot of the things that we really need. That's where I'm kind of a little bit, you know, cause even like somebody brought up Danny Ings, like I can tell you right now what he's really good at. I know that he would solve some of the issues with us not being physical enough in the box. And I think he has good, a good enough buildup play, but then he has issues as well. So maybe it's just from a profile perspective, Abraham works out, but when I'm looking at, like, does he solve the issue of having the build-up play plus the physicality? Not really, but maybe he can improve. You know, I'm not I'm not sure. I'm not mm. sure. But it does feel like Lacazette goes and Abraham potentially comes in. So we'll see maybe if he can do it. You know, I don't know. You know, but somebody else that we've kind of seen during preseason just a little bit, some glimpses of, is, is Balligan, you know, and... I think he fits the mold in terms of the build-up play and stuff. Maybe he doesn't have the physicality, but does Abraham for you block a ball again? You know, is that something that we have to take into consideration as well? Yeah, it is. It really is because I suppose you want to see these young players who have been rewarded with contracts, rewarded also with minutes. So, and sometimes, you know, when it's a Howland boy, you have like this special interest in their progression. So now Balogun has decided to stay. You want to see him, you know, get some minutes because I think that goal on, on the weekend showed, you know, what, what he can potentially be about. And albeit it's a friendly and, and weakened opposition, but that that burst of pace, that little bit of strength to make sure he gets in front of the defender and the composure. So I understand why fans might be a little bit frustrated if Abraham comes in. I suppose maybe Abraham has got obviously more guaranteed minutes and experience, so Arteta perhaps can potentially trust trust Abraham a little bit more. But yeah, I, I hope it doesn't block Abraham. But uh, Sorry, I hope it doesn't block Badigan. But maybe we'll see Badigan used from the flank as well a little bit more than we expect. Which, in fairness, a lot of strikers who work their way into teams, that does happen to a lot of young strikers. They start out slightly more wider than they expect to. And then they kind of, you know, play up front towards, 
towards the, the the peak years of their career. I think even players like Greenwood at, at Man United. I know Rashford's not a striker, but when he first came through, he was. But then he kind of played wide midfield more. So maybe that's more part of Balogun's learning curve and his progression. But essentially, yeah, if you're replacing Lacazette with Aubameyang, then uh, sorry, replacing Lacazette with Abraham, then Balogun is going to be what the third or fourth choice striker. Aubameyang, Abraham, Martinelli. Yeah, like so. There's going to be a lot. There's going to be a lot of competition there when we've only got like what forty odd games this season. So <laughs> like, what's happening? <laughs> like, you know, like from um, how do we get everybody minutes perspective? It's looking a little like okay, what's going on? You know, I do. Is gonna go, sorry, is Balogun going to go on loan? Do you reckon? Maybe that's a possibility. I would say mm-hmm. if Tammy Abraham comes in, Balogun needs to go on loan, and I know people don't want to hear that, you know, because they. I think what it is is when we have exciting players that we've heard about, we want to see them in front of our eyes like right now. But the reality for me is with whether Lacazette goes or or not, like there's not going to be a lot of minutes for Balogun really there. And we also have to prioritize Martinelli's development too. So it's kind of for me, wouldn't Balogun be a better use for us after having, you know, 30 odd games under his belt, maybe somewhere else, then he can come back in and then he will replace a bombing when a bombing goes next summer, supposedly, or, you know, if that happens, you know, so I'm thinking uh, he does need to go on alone. Regardless, I, w- I would just prefer him to get the minute so he could be better for us in the future. But I do know that from an Arsenal perspective, we tend to want to see our people, you know, and we don't trust when they go out on loan. Like, it's not something that we really love. I'd prefer him to go out on loan. You know, for me, it's just a lot of congestion. But then also on the other side, when you look at a bombing and an Abraham coming in, maybe, how do you bring in somebody for 40 million who's been sitting on Chelsea's bench and tell them to then sit behind a bombing? That's another issue that I don't really understand how we would get around that because, you can't drop a bombing, can you? But can you can you realistically bring Abraham in and say sit behind a bombing and we don't have Europe? I mean, what's happening? I mean, do you know what I'm saying, Harry? Like mm. that is also an issue. I think almost the Balogun one will sort itself out. He can go out on loan, but you can't stand a bombing out on loan. <laughs> like you mm. know what I mean? So, what are your thoughts on that? Like bringing in a striker who's clearly is frustrated with the playing time that he's getting at his current club. Would he sign a contract to come to Arsenal without Europe to sit behind an aging Aubameyang? And how does that look? You know, first game comes around, say we bring in Abraham. First game comes around, Aubameyang's on the bench. The media is going crazy, isn't it? You know, what do you think? Well, I think Abraham has been starved of minutes at Chelsea. So if he comes to us, he'll certainly get more minutes, right? And if he comes, he'll replace Lacazette, so he'll be essentially the second choice striker behind a Bamiyang. So he'll get more minutes than what he did under two show at Chelsea. But yeah, you're right. Whether 15, 20 minutes is enough. And if he's doing that three or four or five games in a row, then I'm pretty sure he'll he'll be unhappy. But then there's also the possibility of a Bamiyang starting the season left wing, which means Abraham starts up Horrendous. front. Yeah, maybe so. Um, but Could you imagine I mean, like Abraham, a Bamiyang, <laughs> like, Pepe, like, starting the season. Like, I honestly... Is that bad? Is that bad? I don't like a bombing off the left now. Like, I'm just... And I know, he's done it before. That's where he usually plays. (laughs) I don't like it. I don't like it. It's one of those things where you know you just don't like it for a reason you don't really have. Because once once you show me Emile Smith-Rowe off of the left or even Martinelli off the left, I don't want to see a bombing there anymore. You know, but I guess that's what we'd have to deal with. You know, but I remember when we started off last season with a bombing off of the left, Lacazette through the middle and Willian on the right, and it was dead, you know? So I don't know. I'm just, I don't know. I mean, would you, do you like I mean, a bombing off of the left? Would you I mean, prefer it's worked, that? It's worked before. It's worked before, Jess. So uh, whatever. <laughs> no, I don't care that it's I worked mean, in the past. <laughs> would I? I, oh, I don't know. I mean, I just want to see him scoring goals. And I do believe that. Uh, if we are flowing and we have creative players and everyone is playing well and the team is functioning, I think Aubameyang can play on the left and I think we can score goals. Um, I think it's more about just getting his overall confidence up 
uh, and and his overall like demeanour on the pitch up, so that then he'll be a positive impact on the team. And then I believe he could play in any of those front three positions and, and score goals. Uh, so I mean, look, it's not ideal. I, I want to see him centrally play up front because. That way, I know I've got Saka on the left wing or Pepe on the right wing, and I know we've got two natural midfielders playing playing on the wing. So that's why I don't want to see a Bamming out there. But in the same respect, I'm just looking at ways it can potentially work. And if we're going with with Abraham, maybe it's just a transition period for one season, and then Bamming goes next season. But I don't know. I mean, he, he was kind of playing on the left in the second half, right, in the friendly. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe, maybe, maybe Arteta is still toying with it again. I don't know. I don't know. Here, but here's the, the word toying, right? The last thing we need is more tinkering and all that. We need to figure out what our starting lineup is and just kind of stick with it. And right now, we're talking about ways to fit a group of players into a system when we don't like the beauty of not being in Europe is being able to have a consistent starting eleven, right? So I just feel. Like we may be just creating our own issues with this. And again, like even DJ says, like a bombing on the wings pre prevents us from playing both Pepe and Sock on the wings. You know, we also have somebody in Pepe that needs to be prioritized because he's, I feel like Pepe at, at the moment is, is hot. Like, the last thing you want to do is start him on the bench or make some modifications to the to the front four and leave him out when he's the guy that's going to be scoring goals. So it just feels a little bit like we might be be creating our own issues. But at the same time, I can't say that I would be comfortable with us not bringing in a striker if Lacazette were to leave because I don't think Balogun is ready. So it's, it's a lot. You know, it's a lot. But mm -hmm. we also have to remember that Arteta is not above dropping a bombing. He's done it before, and I, I'm I wouldn't be surprised if he did it again. You know, so and also, sorry, Saka won't yeah. be available. Remember, right? So this either way, true. either way, our, our front three against Brentford is most likely going to be Pepe, Aubameyang, and Lacazette through the middle. I mean, that's what it's going to be, right? Because if it's not going to be that, then it's going to be Willian, Pepe, and Aubameyang. So I think that's. Not to digress, but the team that we're going to see against Brentford when you get go to the tenth game of the season, whoever that is going to be, the, the team will be, I think, quite different. So I think at the minute it's probably about going with something that we're fairly familiar with um, against Brentford, which I believe will be Bamiang on the left wing, because essentially, yeah, Saka's going to be given some time off, rightly so. So I get that if we see a Bamiang left wing against Brentford, everyone will be like, "Oh my God, what are we doing?" But we have to remind <laughs> ourselves that. We're still waiting for some players to come in and there'll be some last minute business as there will for many clubs. We could have like our perfect lineup starting against Brentford. Oh my gosh, it's perfect. Like, you know, it's, it's too perfect. You I know, know so. DWTT just said, um, like I mentioned, Willie and make it stop. I know, but Who? I'm just saying, uh, DWT, yeah, he said, uh, you just said, Willie and make it oh stop, please. Goodness. No, you're right, you're right. But unfortunately, it looks like Willie going to stay. And I'm not saying that like, I want him to play, but. Right at the minute, going into Brentford with what we have available, it feels like uh, a front three of Pepe, <laughs> Aubameyang and Willian is potentially possible. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. I, it, it, it won't happen. It won't happen. It won't happen. That's how we I've started out last season. I, I have nightmares about that front three. It was so yeah. old and so slow. It would not press. They were all conserving energy FC, like up front, like – Walking with Canes FC, like, <laughs> where's my wheelchair FC? Like, it was so bad. I don't want it. I refuse. And plus, Pepe needs to start. Like, even, <laughs> where is it? Dublin Gunnar well, says. With your new contacts in American football, in, in American soccer, can't you kind of facilitate a deal for Willian, please? Can you not make some I was, phone calls? Like, not and, even, and I'm not even lying. I was looking, like, I was doing deep research to see if we had a DP spot available because I was so willing to sacrifice my MLS team to get Arsenal back <laughs> like you know I, but we don't have a DP spot available the guy who was uh, gonna leave is is back so we don't have space for William unfortunately and um uh into Miami is not only the worst team in the MLS but they're crippled by the amount of wages that they're paying Iguain, who's 40 pounds overweight so I don't think they can hold up William as well but Dublin Gunnar says Pepe as a striker, madness, or maybe 
And welcome to Twitter, Dublin Gooner, as well. Dublin Gooner is now on, on Twitter, so looking forward to um, having conversations with you there as well. But I kind of like the idea of Pepe as a striker, to be honest. Like, what do you think about it? Is it madness or maybe? I mean, I could see him playing off the shoulder in a 4 4 2, um, almost a bit like how Reyes used to play for us when he played up front. As a, as a sole striker, I mean, in front of goal, I, oh, no, actually, no, no, I don't see it, sorry, because in front of goal, he's really inconsistent. And I don't know if he's got that hold up play. But maybe, I mean, maybe it could work. Sometimes, you know, when the team's flowing and everyone's creating chances and the, the balls are coming from the fullback. You know, if you just need someone in a box to, to you know, to kind of do an impactful, an impact finish, then he could be that guy. But well, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, listen, if we're going into the season, we're toying with Pepe up front. I think we might need to might need to hurry up that Abraham deal. In all honesty, <laughs> what? I mean, well, it's I'm not like that... he hasn't played there before. I know, but what Pepe up front as a sole striker for Arsenal? Oh, has he played there for us before? No, and the fact that right. um, Abamiang Arteta has never tried it probably means that yeah. he's not interested in seeing it. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you see it at Man City with someone like Sterling, but like I say, the the chance creation is so huge and the dominance is just totally there. So you can like you can almost play like Gundogan up front for Man City because there's just so there's just so many chances. The fullbacks are always bombing forward. Kevin De Bruyne is always putting in crosses, so there's always going to be so many opportunities to score, but at Arsenal, it feels like we're still a little bit more system-based and we need a focal point up front. And I'm not sure if Pepe is that guy. But stranger things have happened. Stranger things have happened. I remember Freddie Lundberg playing up front for a few games when all of our strikers were injured and he popped up with some goals. So you never know. Yeah, Pepe is false nine. I mean, I honestly, I would like to see it. You know, I think he can do it. But You just said uh, you didn't want to be toying and now you're, now you're toying. Well, I don't want said, a toy with a bombing out left. That's what I don't want a toy with. That's, that's, that's less of a toy than Pepe up front. Pepe up front is a big toy. A Bamiang's left wing is like a little toy. A Bamiang started know. before, remember? Yeah, he started there before. <laughs> he's done it. That's who he scored almost all his goals. Here are the numbers, the <laughs> stats. I can already see people with the stats, you know, so it's fine. It's fine. I mean, I think. Luck is that goes. We bring in a striker. It's probably Tammy Abraham. I can already feel it. It it is what it is. We'll just have to deal with it when it happens. But from another perspective, Lacazette is somebody who, I mean, was good for us last season. Maybe has some you know inconsistencies in terms of goal scoring, but he's a big part of our kind of like leadership. You know, he's a quiet leader. He does. I, I'm not going to say he's a quiet leader. I would just say that maybe he doesn't get as much credit for it. But then later on, you hear a lot of the, the young players, especially talk about what he's done for them, you know. So if you lose Lacazette, you no longer have Jaka, Bellerin, and Louise, who's stepping up to become the leaders in this team. Because again, our, our even with them, we've been known as a team that lacks leadership. Without them, we're definitely losing our leadership group, you know. So... What do you think is going to happen from there? Do you do you foresee some sort of signing coming in to make that up, you know, or are you confident that some of the young players will step up and become leaders in their own right? I think they'll have to, just to be honest. And whilst you can question the ability of you know Bellerin, Louise, Lacazette, and Jacka, you know that they are leaders, and and like you say, there's all different types of leaders. But what they what they bring to the club in terms of uh, being a shoulder to cry on for the younger players, uh, show, showing them, you know, how to do things or how to act in a certain way. It's really important. So now it's time for our, our other players to step up. And and uh, the likes of, of Rob Holding and Callum Chambers and Kieran Tierney um, will all have to, you know, take over from that because I see those guys as, as, as having those leadership qualities in the way they communicate with the players and 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 how they perhaps uh, work with the likes of Saka and, and Balogun in the future. So I think they'll have to step up because we aren't signing those experienced players that some are like myself called for in the summer. We're going for younger players. So now it's about our um, more experienced players in Rob Holden and Callum Chambers to, to step up and, and become, those, become those leaders and, and those, those voices. Uh, because I know, obviously, with the word experience, we, we almost 
link that with success or you know or, or being a player that's won, won so much in the game and obviously the likes of Rob Holden and whatnot they haven't but they are our most experienced players they're probably now two of our longer serving players at the club after <coughs> after Bellerin and Jacques Lee so those are going to be the guys that you hope would uh, would take on or become part of that leadership group as well as someone like Party and and Aubameyang. Uh yeah I mean let's be honest we don't have those those colossal leaders that we perhaps want, do we? In terms of ability, uh, you know, international recognition, we just don't really have that in our team. So it's time for other players to to develop that. Uh, Kieran Tini, obviously, is the only one that really sticks out for me. It's so true. The only person I really can think about or think of is Kieran Tierney. But I believe that people that we probably never thought were going to be leaders will step up and and make themselves heard. You know, it's not just about like who's going to be yelly and shouty on the pitch. You know, it's going to be who drags us forward when we need it. Um, Arteta spoke about like, you know, um, Tierney having that, um, Smith Rowe having that, Martinelli having that. I know they're quite young, but they, they are the types of players that will change the game for you. And then the locker room, once the other people are gone, I'm sure they're not going to be sitting there quiet. Somebody will step up and, and, and make their voices heard. I think, you know, there were reports that came out that Arteta is looking at Ben White as somebody who could potentially be a leader. I haven't seen him be that for either of his club teams, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he doesn't have that in his locker per se. And then you have somebody like Thomas Party who I would expect him to become somewhat of our Fernandinho. That's what I anticipate him being. He will be older. He'll be one of the oldest in the squad. And he may not be yelly and shouty, but I think that he'll he'll be able to do a job for us and, and make sure that the young players know what they're supposed to be doing. And again, when you get rid of, you know, your Jacques and your Bellerins, the people that are naturally in those positions, you know, things change, you know, so I would expect them to, you know what I mean? So yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, we'll definitely see what happens there. You guys, there's 125 of you guys watching and there are only 41 likes. What's going on? Get it up, man. It's, I'm, I'm going to like, I'm going to like, I've liked, I've liked. Yeah, let me go like the video since, let me do my job here. Boop. I liked it. You guys, make sure you guys are liking the video. It really helps the channel get seen and all that great and wonderful stuff. It helps the channel grow. The last month or so, the channel has like exploded and that's because you guys are liking the video and subscribing to the channel. So let's keep that going. But you guys want to go ahead and throw some questions out there. We have exhausted the lock is that talk. This, the strikers, we'll see what happens with that. I, I see that the Abraham talk is not something that people really like to talk about. I get it. Like he's not, it optically, it doesn't look good, you know? So it just kind of is what it is, isn't it? Somebody in the chat was saying, what do I think about Isco? I don't think about Isco. I don't want him anywhere near this club. Um, I don't want him, Coutinho, none of those. I, I'm done. I don't want any of that. Um, I did think it was interesting that I, I do think that this is a little bit of like maybe people just reading into things, but there are now rumors circulating that Odegaard is unhappy at Real Madrid and, you know, he's sad and moping today. around. Yeah. And I was like, I think we're reading a little bit too much into it, but if at this point we did a U-turn and, and we were able to acquire Odegaard, would you be happy about it? Or would you be kind of like, mm, then they're done that. What are your thoughts on Odegaard maybe coming back? You know, he's also a natural leader as well. So if he were to come in, he would have that leadership ability. Yeah, I'd be happy with Odegaard. Obviously, it's died down at the minute. So you almost forget about him and, and what he did for us. Uh, um, granted, it wasn't a hell of a lot, but I think he was a good player. I think there was so much more to see from him. I wouldn't be surprised if that deal happens, uh, if the Madison thing doesn't work or the uh, woo deal doesn't happen. I think someone like um, uh, Erdegaard will be a bit of sensible business. It might free up some money in other areas, i.e. Neves or Basuma or Locatelli, if that, if that can possibly happen. So it could be a good little squad signing. And I think the, the more I see of ESR in pre-season, the more I feel like he's going to be played centrally. So uh, a nice little loan signing to provide competition might be, might be a decent bit of business. And... Once again, continuity is really important. And if Erdegaard knows the club, knows the manager, knows the process, it makes things a little bit easier for us. So I wouldn't be against it, to be honest. Yeah, for sure. I mean, at this point, I wouldn't hate it. I still think he has a lot of talent and all that kind of stuff. 
So, um, and I think he would cost less than Madison. So again, we might be able to spread our resources just a little bit further. Billy's asking me about Hoppy for Arsenal. I would say no. Um, um, I think he's good. He's up and coming and all that, but he's still quite raw. And I feel as though we already have Martinelli and Balligan and we don't need another project type striker. I do think he's good. And I do think he'll have a bright future though, as you know, um, Nashville Gunnar saying, I only like for George. That's cold, man. Do you think he has an opinion on a new right back? I have no idea who we possibly want for a right back. I'm, I'm not sure <laughs> at all. He's never really told me anything about that. So you have to ask him when he comes back off of vacation. New Dawn game says, what score do you give Arteta and Adu on their transfer dealings so far? Oh, great um, question. What a great question. Is it if this is like it's I guess we'll just say out of insane. ten? We'll just do out of ten. Yeah. Yeah. Uh ladies first. So far. I mean, just based <laughs> on what we have, like and is this based on like okay, let me not make it too complicated. I would say that all of the signings so far, if you if you count if you count Ben White in there. I would say that they're they're spot on in terms of we're replacing things that are not there. You know what I mean? So we don't have backup central midfielder. The profile is perfect. Tavares is coming in to back up Tierney. Profile is perfect. Ben White is coming in to replace David Luiz. Profile is perfect. So I would say in terms of the incomings, even though I know we still have a ways to go, they all hit the mark in terms of what we need profile wise, you know, and filling gaps in the squad that need filling um, in terms of outgoings, because I don't, I never really had high hopes for what we would sell Gwendozy for. I think it's good that we've gotten rid of him. Um, is the price like meh? Yeah, it is. But I mean, if you thought we were going to get more than that with one year left on his deal, I don't know. You know, um, other than that, I mean, Mavropanos has left. Um, Jack is not really gone yet. Bellerin's not really gone yet. But I also think that that has something to do with the market and the fact that we're not in a good position in, to sell our players. So I would I would say at the moment I would give it a six. You know, I would say it's a six because we still need to get so much more done, even though I'm optimistic that a lot of it will get done. But what I will say is that they got a lot of points for me for identifying gaps in the squad, filling those gaps and filling them with the right profiles at prices that make sense to me. I know Ben White is expensive, but it's it's English tax in the English national team, up and coming player. He's not in his prime. He's in pre-prime. So that's what you kind of expect to pay. So, yeah, six. I would say, oh, it's hard, you know, because I've got so many agendas and narratives that I need to push and I need to be consistent. But I'm going to say five out of ten so far. Uh, but yeah, that's not that's not a criticism. Um, I just think we need to make sure that we address a couple of key positions if we can, um, and obviously shift some of the the dead wood. Uh, but you know, it's not it's not a negative five out of ten. It's a the supermarket is still open and we are still shopping. So when the window is closed, I feel like I can give a much fairer reflection of of how we're performing. But let's not forget as well, some key contract extensions in and around that transfer window, which I know aren't new signings as such, but yeah. it's really important that we've secured the likes of, of Balogun and ESR and obviously priced that Saka and Martinelli. So yeah, I'll say five out of 10, but, but I'm, I'm convinced it will be an eight or nine out of 10. I am. I'm convinced they're going to make sure that we strengthen every area possible. It might not be the player that we want. It might not be the type of deal that we want. It might be a loan deal. It might be an obligation to buy. It might be a transfer. Some players might still be here who, who you want to leave, i.e. Jacka, Willia and Bellerin. But in terms of incomings, I think regardless, we'll still get the players in. But the deals might change based on what we make from Xhaka and Bellerin. So uh, it might be an Erdegaard loan instead of a Madison purchase because we can't shift Iketia, Xhaka, Bellerin, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. Five out of ten. Yeah, for sure. And so I know Lukonga is not just a backup. Like when I say like backups, like I'm not really saying like they, they're not going to have any role. I'm just saying that in I Lukonga is basically replacing Torreira and Guendouzi, you know, so they're they wouldn't be they they're not really 
they're not people that we needed in the squad last season. Like, you know what I mean? Like when, when we talk about like, he's not replacing Jacka and Jack is the starter. So I think maybe backups just seems a little bit harsh. Like they're not going to have a, a role to play. But when I think about backups, I'm thinking about players that when like Thomas is not available or Tierney, two of our most important players will be able to have somebody step in and we don't lose a lot from it. I think Wakonga was very impressive. I'm willing to go overboard with it, with him and say that he's going to be the second coming of, <laughs> you know, Vieira <laughs> or something like that, whatever. He did I don't look care. really good though, didn't he? He did look really good. Yeah, he did. I he looked good. So, really comfortable the um, backups is probably not the right word to use. Squad players, you know, they're going to have important roles, but I still think that they're super important because without those, you know what happened? We finished eighth. Like, you know, um, does Terrera exist? The funny I thing is, so. does Terrera actually exist? <laughs> Has he come back? No, Where's he been? I don't, know. I don't know what's going on there. No idea. No idea. I mean, he's it's really our strange. player, but he's not with us. Yeah, really strange. He must oh, just be. Oh, he just know, finished the Copa. at home. Uh, oh. Yeah, but still. But yeah, no, no, no rumors, no noise about him whatsoever, which is quite, quite bizarre, isn't it? I'm not sure if there's been any transfer stories on, on Torreira. I know he wanted to return home or. Or go to Boca, was it? Did he want to play for Boca Juniors? Or am I imagining that? Um, but yeah, really strange one. Really strange one. Uh, but yeah, I hope, I hope they sort out his deal, obviously for personal reasons as well. I hope he finds his next move. But yeah, you're pretty 99% sure his time at Arsenal is has come to an end. Yeah, I see a lot of people kind of giving these hypotheticals, like if we couldn't sell him, then what's going to happen? Like, would you, you know, do this and that and the third I personally don't want anybody here that doesn't want to be here because no matter how much you think that they're obviously professionals and they'll play hard, if you don't want to be somewhere, you know your your levels drop. And he's made it very, very clear that he doesn't want to be at Arsenal, almost to the point where it sometimes it feels as though there's something there, like a little twinge of shade, you know, they're thrown in there about us or whatever, like nobody forced you to sign for us. It's not our fault, you know, whatever that you signed for Arsenal. So I, I personally wouldn't want him anywhere near the club. And I would even just go as far as just to keep loaning him out because I don't mm -hmm. think you need somebody moping around, you know, at Colony because he, he really never really, he never really adapt, adapted, you know? So Deb says, with the signing so far, where would you expect us to finish in the league? It's just so difficult. You know, I, I do, you know, um, based on, you know, obviously the performance that we had against Millwall, you know, 4-1 battering, I would say <laughs> challenging at least, you know, right there at the top. No, I'm joking. But it's hard to say, you guys. You know, it really, really is because I think we've improved the squad but maybe not the first 11 like we want to. So at the moment, I can't say that I would see us in anywhere higher than six, you know, because the other teams are also improving as well. Some of them have improved their first teams. Like you look at somebody like Leicester, I think they brought in some players that, that could, put, well, no, not really. Cause some, no, not really. They've actually gotten mostly backups so, as well because you know, Pasendak is not going to start over Iannaccio and Vardy. Sumari is not going to start over Ndidi. And Bertrand is not going to start. So really, they've only improved their squad as well. So I would say maybe somewhere around sixth at the moment. You know? What do you think? Uh, yeah. I think I think we'll finish fourth. Yeah, I think we'll get top four. I think it'll be Man City, Chelsea, uh, Liverpool and Arsenal. I think we're going to finish fourth. That's my prediction. Uh, you said so, yeah. who? Uh, Man City, Man City, Chelsea, Liverpool, Arsenal. I think we'll come fourth. What happened to Man United? No, they're not. They're not. It's not happening. Wow. Well, what's happening. really funny is. Um, I mean, so, just... honestly, I, to I totally forgot about Man United. So I think we're going to finish fifth. No. Yeah, I'm like, what? No, no. I still, I still, okay. Maybe swap United for Liverpool, for Chelsea. But no, or for Chelsea, for Chelsea maybe. Yeah. But if well, Chelsea is my team, 
Chelsea is my team to um, not do as well as they think they're going to do, but that's just me. We'll go when we do our predictions. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely hot takes uh, going to take place there as well, but it's just so funny because in the group chat that we have for the terrace, you know, everybody's pretty much saying like if Manchester United fans need to be expecting to win the league with what they've done so far, but they don't want to wear that, you know, cause once you're like, if you say it with your chest, you know, and then it doesn't happen, then you have to like live with that. But, um, and I know that like a lot of Arsenal fans are, are freaking out because they, they signed Sancho and Varane, but you guys, the reality is they're they're ahead of us in terms of what they're they've already signed most of the players that we haven't even signed yet. You know, they've si- signed their number ten, they've signed their their starting center back, they've signed the right back. You know, uh, Luke Shaw has been around for a long time. Um, they have a world class midfielder in, in in Pogba. They got a striker, so we're just now starting to build our team. But theirs is almost done. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like, why are we comparing ourselves to them? I mean, honestly, like, come on, you know, so I think we're just kind of like at the beginning of our journey, to be honest, you know, I mean, Oli's been there for like three years. Uh, Arteta has been here for like a year and a half, you know, so that's just me. Yeah, listen, I I, I think, um, I think Man United have have made some good signings. I think Varane is going to prove to be a really good (laughs) signing. Uh, more so than Sancho, but that's just my that's just my weird thing over Sancho. I uh, I'm I'm not sure he's going to be as good as everyone thinks he's going to be in the Premier League. That's just a vibe I get. But regardless vibe. of that, regardless of that, whilst I respect Solskjaer, um, I still think with him in charge there'll be limitations. And also, whilst I totally forgot them about top four, uh, so they could get top four, but so could we. Who knows? Who knows? It's just a vibe but I get. There's vibe. always one team that everybody thinks on paper they're going to do something and then they don't. You know what I mean? There's always one. So you have Man City, Chelsea, and Man United at the moment. I think people are sleeping on Liverpool. Mm. I think there's because they've never needed world-class players to really carry them. They've always kind of had like hardworking players with some really good players in and around, and then they kind of become world-class. So I don't really actually think for Liverpool it's about – signing a bunch of players I think it's about getting the players that they have back healthy and they still have Klopp like I think people are sleeping on Liverpool but one of Chelsea Man United and or Man City is going to to flop at least one and then we're going to be somewhere below there I believe you know yeah I mean who am I who am I kidding top four is going to be really hard so I might have to I mean top six is going to be tough I mean, yeah, I'm just trying to be optimistic. Look, the truth is, if we don't get top four or <laughs> we don't challenge for that, everyone's going to want the manager out. So I'm almost trying to, you know, be like, well, if this is what you want, then then let's say it, say we can get it or let's hope we can do it. And like you say, I know Man United have made some great signings. They really have. But yeah, yeah, yeah. it happens every year. And Pogba was, Pogba's been world-class for three, four years. You know, Fernandez is world-class, but it hasn't changed you know, it hasn't changed that much for them in terms of actually making that final leap. So, so who knows if Pogba leaves, uh, things are changing with with Man United. So I don't know, man. But well, I basically, think we they're can get they're buying their love. Like you know what I mean. Like after the whole ESL thing, I feel like they know that they needed to do a madness. You know, so we'll see. Um, Lone Star, what is this? Lone Star and Newman. Are having? Are you guys having a bad day? You guys don't want us to be optimistic. I Come feel on, like but... I am being realistic. Yeah, you are. I'm being optimistic. You're being realistic. But it's all we've got. It's <laughs> all we've got, right? It's all we've got. Well, that's all I've got. I'm not gonna just, you know, I'm gonna I aim for the stars, shoot for the stars, as they say. So yeah, I mean, I just feel like I feel like we could potentially do something special this season because we've yeah. got some really good good young players. I don't think there's anything wrong with thinking that as there isn't wrong with thinking we're going to finish six. But I think anything below that, I feel like would be could be deemed as being a bit negative because I feel like we can improve on last season, which would be anything above eighth, right? So Jess has went for six, I went for four. They're just numbers, guys. They're just numbers. Yeah, I mean, because because to me, honestly, like I just feel again, you guys last season, I wish I had been doing these shows then I said we were going to finish between eighth and tenth. I just knew we weren't good enough. 
Cause I always look about, look and see what everybody else is doing. I don't just look at us. That's just not me, you know? So even this season, I feel, even if we improve our squad, like let's say we get, you know, the Ben whites in that. And then we, even if we do bring in um, a, the center midfielder and the attacking midfielder, and maybe even a striker and a right back, I still feel like, because we're really trying to close a huge gap and then other people are still going to improve their squads We'll, we're still going to struggle to get top six because it's not just about us. So I try to be as realistic as possible. I do think we're improving the floor, meaning we're not going to be down in 15th. You know, that's not going to happen. But um, yeah, I think we're, we're teen, we're kind of in between optimism and, and realism here. Like we, you know what I mean? Cause we still want to try to keep it a little bit upbeat because if we get bogged down in the negativity, we'll never get, what's the point of doing this? You know what I mean? So, um, but yeah, we'll, we'll end it there, you guys, because I just really wanted to talk about the Lacazette thing. Um, just to let you guys know, I'll be on Twitter, in a Twitter space in about 10 minutes or so with Hale and Arsenal. Um, I think the Euro expert is going to be there. Alex, the Euro expert is going to be there as well. Some more of us, you know, so we'll be talking more about transfers and all of that in a Twitter space. So make sure you guys join us there. Like the video, subscribe to the channel. Um, yeah, Newman, we know you like negativity. I can see, <laughs> I can feel it. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> you can, um, it'll be on like at it's just Enio, you guys. So you can follow me there. You can follow, um, Harry at it's DJ Harry on Twitter as well for more Jacka prop. You still get to do that. Cause he's still here. Don't you? Guys, he's still here, man. He's still here. It's going to be good times when he's starting Brentford away the first game of the season. Maybe even wearing the captain's armband. Who knows? Good times oh. ahead. Good times Oh, my ahead. goodness. Okay, no, guys. <laughs> I'll be back tomorrow. I'll talk to you guys later. Bye, guys. <laughs>